Welcome to Hub History, where we go far beyond the Freedom Trail to share our favorite stories from the history of Boston, the hub of the universe. This is episode 258, The Nazis of Copley Square, with Professor Charles Gallagher. Hi, I'm Jake. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be joined by Professor Charles Gallagher, author of the recent book, The Nazis of Copley Square, The Forgotten Story of the Christian Front. The book is an in-depth accounting of an organization that was wildly popular in Boston and beyond in the years before the U.S. entered World War II. The Christian Front was deeply rooted in Catholic doctrines, but the value at its core was a form of anti-communism that members treated as interchangeable with anti-Semitism. Professor Gallagher will tell us how the group was founded and how the doctrines of Catholic action and the mystical body of Christ theory enabled their hateful ideology. He'll also introduce the intellectual leaders of the group, the street fighters who led it down the primrose path to paramilitarism, and the Nazi spymaster who turned the group toward treason. But before I talk to Professor Gallagher, I just want to pause and say thank you to everyone who supports the show on Patreon. A few weeks back, you might remember me saying that I was going to start subscribing to a new online recording service. Well, this week's interview is the first one that I recorded using that new service. Unlike my old one, this new service uses video to facilitate the interview, similar to Zoom, but with higher audio quality. I think you'll notice that this interview feels more natural and conversational than some of our past interviews, and that's because we could see each other's faces and react to nonverbal cues. Our Patreon supporters made the upgrade possible, and it's just one example of the ways I want to keep improving the show for you, the listener. You can become a supporter and help me make Hub History better for as little as $2 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash hubhistory, or visit hubhistory.com and click on the Support Us link. And thanks again to all our new and returning sponsors. I'm joined now by Professor Charles R. Gallagher. Professor Gallagher is a member of the Society of Jesus, who teaches in the History Department at Boston College, where he studies the history of right-wing movements, the intersection of intelligence and religion, American Catholicism, papal diplomacy, international relations, and the history of the Holocaust. His previous book, Vatican Secret Diplomacy, won the John Gilmary Shea Prize from the American Catholic Historical Association. Professor Gallagher, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Jake. So your book is The Nazis of Copley Square, and it's subtitled The Forgotten Story of the Christian Front. And the Christian Front is mostly forgotten today, but our listeners might well remember one of the key organizers and propagandists who was deeply involved with the Christian Front. Can you remind our listeners who Father Charles Coughlin was? I argue that Father Charles Coughlin was the first celebrity priest of the 20th century. He was a brilliant, tech-savvy, Canadian Catholic priest who immigrated to the United States and set up a radio show in the late 1920s, which became one of the most listened to uh, weekly programs from the early 30s into the early 1940s. It's estimated that he had about 30 million listeners every week on his Sunday radio broadcast. And to put that into perspective... The highest rated network television show, which is usually is one of those shows like America's Got Talent or something like that. Those shows usually get about 12 million viewers per week. And this priest who had a, a show that combined politics and religion had a radio show of vast audiences. And it eventually, by the mid 1930s, developed into him creating his own political party he had a surrogate run for president because he was born in Canada. He couldn't run for president himself. But it it kind of creates this really interesting question about what if he were an American? Would he have, would he have forsaken his collar or tried to combine his Roman collar with, uh, with the presidency? And he was extremely controversial because during the course of his radio career, he became increasingly anti-Semitic in his broadcasts. Well, yeah, it seems like anti-Semitism 
and anti-communism and sort of the, the interplay between those two things were really the, the pillars of his personal ideology. How did he get that way? How did he embrace those two philosophies? He was extremely upset by the Soviet Revolution, the Russian Revolution, 1917. The Orthodox uh, Christians were being put under the under the bayonets of Trotsky's new Red Army. It was really a bloody, bloody persecution. You either you either had to recant your faith, your Christian faith, and and join the Communist Party, or else you know you received either a bullet or a bayonet in most cases. And so Father Coughlin, uh, along with other Protestant, this is the other thing, another, a lot of evangelical Protestant American observers were finding the same thing. It's something historians, I think, have neglected, that that there seems to be what I mentioned in the book as kind of an ecumenical anti-communism that emerges really over the over the issue of the Russian Revolution. And then in the mid-1930s, the Spanish Civil War heightens the entire situation. And that really, the Spanish Civil War becomes the final credible experience for Father Coughlin in connection to communist uh, displacement of Christianity. And he sees, he's finally come to the, his own conclusion that both Lenin and particularly Marx, Marx and Lenin were Jewish. And so that this, this new political ideology on the face of the earth, which is expanding rapidly, is in effect a secular Judaism, which has as its goal the eradication of global Christianity. And it's um, and it all comes to a head. And this vortex of the 1930s, and it, it's through the Spanish Civil War that the the, the term Christian Front is coined. That Coughlin then embraces. It, we associate him with that name, but he didn't actually originate it. It comes out of the Spanish Civil War, if I understand correctly. Yeah, that's correct. That was one of the things I wanted to do with the book was kind of figure out where that term came from. And originally, it was contrived in Britain uh, by a theologian named Arnold Lunn who most people wouldn't know about, but he was a, a Methodist. Father was a Methodist leader in Britain. Who, he converted to Roman Catholicism in 1933 when he was studying at Oxford. And he wanted to use anti-communism as a way to mend or bridge the divisions within the Christian churches since the time of the Reformation. And so he created this concept that would be a moral bulwark against communism uh, so that Christians of all both Catholic and Protestant uh, persuasions could come together and present a moral front against expansion, what they saw as expansionist red communism, and face it as a, as a moral problem rather than a military problem. Um, however, once Father Coughlin in Detroit gets wind of this rather benign con uh, concept grounded in in kind of a moral philosophy of righteousness, Coughlin decides that he's going to take that term and use it towards his own ends, and gives it gives it uh, a, a weaponization. He actually he he weaponizes that term, and the Christian Front actually becomes paramilitarized as I show in the book, mm -hmm. by 1939 and into 1941. Lund himself helped to get the, the Christian front of foothold here in Boston, right? He, he gave an address, I believe, it, at BC, at your uh, institution there in 1937, to help popularize the idea of forming a Christian front in America. Yeah, correct. Uh, this is one, uh, one of the uh, rare times when a professor from Notre Dame <laughs> – uh, was welcomed at Boston College. And in 1937, <laughs> in 1937, he came to Boston and gave a couple of speeches actually at Boston College about his experience in the in the Spanish Civil War as a correspondent. Lund, Lund ended up over in Madrid as a correspondent for some Catholic magazines and newspapers. And his speeches at Boston College were extremely anti-communistic 
And he doesn't utter the words Christian front yet, but he's about to, they're on the tip of his tongue. And by 1938, he really solidifies that, that term, but it's his speeches at Boston College that really flesh out publicly how he wants to proceed in his own anti-communism. And so he's, in his speeches in Boston, he was riling up by offering this laundry list, this litany of of uh, really brutal actions that the communist government or the socialist government, the popular front government in Spain, which was the left-wing government, was meeting out against Catholics. And so he, part of, part of the idea of the Christian front was that the left-leaning Spanish government at the time was known pop, as the popular front government. He wanted to create a Christian front that again would be a, a moral force against the popular front government. But then when Father Coughlin figured out that that concept had resonance with his listeners, he, he militarized it and paramilitarized it. That militarization happened over the the course of a, a handful of years, it sounds like, sort of from 1937 to 39, 40-ish, I guess. Correct. In the midst of all that, that's happening in parallel with the rise of the Nazi party in, in Germany. And there's a what seems to me like a watershed moment when Coughlin gives this radio address right after Kristallnacht in 1938. Can you describe for the listener how he turned that night of these terrible attacks on German Jews into an argument for the victimization of Catholics or Christians and more generally. Coughlin has always been very critical of the U S government's position on the Spanish civil war that the Roosevelt administration never condemned the popular front government uh, flat out and over 6,000 priests, nuns, and seminarians were executed mm-hmm. during a 18 month phase of the Spanish civil war. And, and he says, you know, he, he noticed that the U S government never made any protest mm-hmm. internationally. And, um, when he sees what happens at crystal knocked, he creates his own grievance claim because the, the outcry of both the Roosevelt administration and the American press is immediate and it's worldwide and it's a, it's a, it's a banging gong against the Nazis. And so he fashions this radio address on November 21st of 1938, where he blames the Jews for their own persecution. If you can imagine, he, talks about the godlessness of many Jews who have become irreligious in his words. In other words, they've stopped practicing the pietistic practices. People who we'd consider Jew- culturally Jewish today. Yeah, culturally Jewish. They've, they've stopped um, going to synagogue and, and they have moved away from practice, mm-hmm. practical. So he makes a distinction between practical Jews and secular Jews. He calls them secular Jews. And he finds that the secular Jews have all become communists. They've been seduced, in his words, by the uh, by the social justice impulse within what Marxism, Leninism is for him. And it's it's these uh, it's these Jews who have brought upon themselves their own perdition in the crystal knocked. And so this speech is about um uh, you know, five minutes into the speech of an hour long speech, he's talking about how Jews need to reject communism and come back to the faith of Abraham. And, um, and it, it becomes, it's, it's just a, a horribly insidious speech from the levels, from all political levels and also religious levels. And it, it really poisons the listenership against the Jews and in many ways fashions his first real pro-Nazi statements. I mean, it becomes clear that he views fascism and Nazism as the, as the main bulwarks now against the uh, continued expansion of international communism. What did that do for his broadcast career? Was that a, a boost? Did it drag him down? Was he subject to investigation. I have to imagine it didn't pass unremarked on in the U.S. 
the speech itself created a a maelstrom of backlash mm-hmm. and all sorts of uh, publicity about the speech. It was front page news for many days in late 19, 1938. The, the thing about Father Coughlin is he was extremely shrewd and astute, but he was also untrustworthy. Hmm. And so he deliberately pulled himself off the air. The, the, his, his largest audience was in New York City. He broadcast out of WMCA in New York City. And as, as your listeners, I'm sure know, there was no television then. Radio was the medium of the day. And so these thousands and thousands of listeners were very important, but they were all radio listeners. So he, he pulls himself off the air, but then claims that WMCA was shutting him down. This then becomes what he wants to create is a First Amendment issue, Mm -hmm. a free speech issue. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that he understands or the thing that he knows is that way back 30 years earlier in 1909, there was a Catholic priest in New York named Edward McGlynn who was censored in his pulpit by the church. Uh, I believe he was preaching in St. Patrick's Cathedral and he was pulled out of the pulpit uh, by the by his religious superiors and a hundred thousand people marched on Fifth Avenue in uh, protest uh, for violation First Amendment violations on the part of the church hundred thousand Catholics so this McGlynn situation was an explosion 30 years earlier now most historians, um, have kind of seen it as a blip on the radar, and they don't even mention it in the context of the 30s or 40s. But Coughlin, who would have been living at that time and had studied the church history, modern church history, would have known about the McGlynn situation. And so I think he wanted to create his own, you know, 100,000 person march down Fifth Avenue. And so he creates himself as a victim. But and And so what it does is he he really amps up his listenership through his uh, kind of crafty style of creating himself as a victim. And from 1938 until he's taken off the air in 1942, he does play the role of the victim. Even though he's got one of the largest listening audiences in the United States, he continues to claim uh, victimhood. As he's playing the victim card, that sort of creates an opportunity for for us to, to meet another player in this story. Because a man named John Cassidy springs to Coughlin's defense. Can you tell us a little bit about who Cassidy was and how he went from sort of this unemployed wannabe FBI agent to the head of a anti-communist organization? Yeah, these are the sorts of people I really like digging around in archives to figure out who they are. When I was going into this project, I always thought, you know, the thing that I didn't want to do was write another book on Father Coughlin. I actually thought we don't need another book on Father Coughlin. I was more interested in who these ground level, street level, what I call foot soldiers were up to, because those are the people that are getting it done at the grassroots level for Father Coughlin. Again, if you read the standard histories, you wouldn't know that Father Coughlin had a massive street level grassroots organized operation going on. John Cassidy is a very devout Catholic He was a graduate of St. John's University Law School. He tried three times to pass the New York City bar and was unsuccessful at that. And by 1935, he's wandering around trying to find a job for himself. I actually found that he he applied to the FBI to become an FBI agent. And uh, his psychological profile was done by the FBI. They rejected him, of course. And so he's stuck with he's stuck with these kind of visions where he wants to be a person who's connected to larger worldly events and in control of them. But he also he's also this devout Catholic. And so when the Coughlin movement decides to organize in New York City as an anti-communist movement, he presents himself as a charismatic figure who in Coughlin's eyes is quite well-educated. Most Catholics were not university 
educated at that time. So he was impre- impressive to Coughlin. He was, in fact, a very excellent organizer. He was a charismatic figure, but he was not in any way a thinker or a person of ideas. He was pretty reactive to situations, but he was also very uh, antagonistic, very militaristic, and he would be the one who would put in place the paramilitary cells within the Christian Front Organization. I should explain to your listeners that the Christian Front Organization, at one point, the FBI suggested that they had about 100,000 members. And so these would have been Catholics with card-carrying documents indicating that they were members of the Christian Front. The paramilitarization that we're talking about is that on each membership card, the candidate was asked to put whether they had military service activity or not. And so those people, if you indicated you had prior service in the military, you were picked out by Cassidy to populate what he called the action committees, which were these units of between 12 and 17 men who would be trained in weapons and tactics within the Christian front, and that the other members, the other thousands of members who were public-facing, would never know that these paramilitary cells even existed within the Christian front organization itself. Yeah, you mentioned that these would be card-carrying members of the Christian front. It seems like it was very important to Coughlin that there would be this public declaration of membership and that, that there would be literal membership cards. If the goal was to organize something like a paramilitary organization, why wasn't the Christian Front a secret society like the Freemasons or the KKK? That's an excellent question. And I believe that the reason is that in 1810, the American bishops outlawed Catholics to be members of secret societies. They're partic- the bishops are particularly thinking of the Freemasons, um, although later on, groups like the Molly Maguires will emerge. And so what's happening with the Christian front is that this, is, this was the very intriguing piece to me about the Christian front, is that they always aim to be devout Catholics. They always aim for kind of moral permission to do what they do. And so by issuing membership cards, they're making a statement, not only to the public, but to the church, that they are not a secret society. They don't intend to be like the Freemasons. They want to be an authentic, upfront, Catholic religious organization. And so that's why they have their membership cards. But interestingly enough, as time goes on and the FBI starts to get closer and closer to shutting them down, the first thing that they do is not warn their members of a potential FBI raid. The first thing they do is go gather the membership cards and move them to an offsite space that the FBI will not be able to track down. And so, in fact, those those membership cards that were so dear to them never were found by the FBI. They, they outfoxed the FBI in getting that material uh, away from them. So we don't know how many of our grandparents belong to the Christian front. That's true. Actually, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have the membership cards. Well, you mentioned how important it was to Coughlin and, and the front to be a group in good standing with the church also. And I don't know quite how to ask this question, but in the book, you, you point out that there are two principles or doctrines of Catholicism that were popular at the time and maybe have fallen by the wayside since then that Coughlin was able to, I guess, exploit in a way. I don't come from a, a Catholic background, so I'm hoping that you can help me introduce the listener to the mystical body of Christ theory or, or doctrine. Keep in mind that the Catholic church is centered in the neighborhood's in the local parishes, and it's almost kind of a a ghettoized, singular mentalite which takes over in in those neighborhoods and streets of the local parish. And what the Pope was promoting from the mid 1920s, really through the 1950s, was this theology which he called the mystical body of Christ theology. It was a theology aimed at unity within the Catholic Church, centered in Christ's body as being mystical. What that means is that the the Pope 
this is Pope Pius XI at this point, he's centering this theology in the letters of St. Paul, which talks about anything that happens to the part has impact on the whole. Christ, as the head of the church, has impact on who we are as the members of Christ's body. The members of Christ that make up Christ's body are all baptized Catholics throughout the world. And so what I view as happening is that that theology breaks down borders, breaks down national borders, and it becomes transnational. What it means is that if Catholics are being put up against the walls and executed in Barcelona, that has impact on Catholics in Boston. They feel that pain. This is a theology which was dominant and gave Catholics in the United States a share in the tribulations of their, and this is another word you don't hear these days, but they used it, their co-religionists on the other side of the globe or over in Europe. They felt they felt that they too were being persecuted. And so this is another, this is a way that Coughlin really is able to spread his grievance claims against Jews and communists and bring these devout Catholics to undertake a paramilitarization because they feel that they're going to have a moral permissibility to do that. Part of that is the in-group, out-group boundary being drawn by baptism. Right. The baptized become our brothers in Christ that we won't go to war against. And everybody else is sort of on the outside and more permissible to be an opponent. Yeah, that's the other thing I wanted to do as a historian is to kind of remind people that in the 1960s, that script got flipped. And now there's a greater emphasis on Christian solidarity grounded in in a common humanity, not necessarily in baptism. But what I had to kind of indicate to the readership of my book was that those equations didn't apply in the 1930s. It was separate. It was distinct. It was, as you say, in-group, out-group. And Coughlin was extremely adept at aggravating those delineations. And then the other doctrine that what was Catholic action and sort of how did it provide cover for the front when they were scrutinized from, from within the church? Without these two theologies, this group probably would never have survived and been able to do what they did. Catholic action was a, a, a wonderful concept devised in the early 1920s by Pope Pius XI for social uplift, help of the poor, literacy movements within the Catholic Church, uplift of the downtrodden, trying to uh, figure out how to adjust to the economic depression of 1929. Catholic action meant running soup kitchens. But what it did was it delinked the uh, papacy itself from the actual activity of Catholicism at the street level. And it kind of diffused the authority of the church down into the parishes. So what was going on was the, the Pope said, if you as a Catholic do anything with even a token blessing of your local parish priest or of the local church, you are doing Catholic action. You are doing what the papacy wants you to do. And so what it provides is a very vigorous new outlet for lay Catholics. And by that, I mean Catholics who aren't ordained clerics to go out and start soup kitchens, start literacy reading groups, start um, labor organizations for Catholics, start all sorts of social movements. And what this, and then they, they say, because your parish, if your parish priests give their okay, or if your local bishop doesn't say anything against it, then that's, Catholic action, and you're doing the work of the church. You're kind of in accordance with the teachings of the scriptures and of of the papacy. And so that's precisely what the Christian Front did. They they were able to form themselves as a group of lay people. Their leaders were not priests. They were ordinary lay Catholics, non-ordained Catholics. And this also was rather revolutionary for the time. That was not usually done 
in the Catholic Church. And so when the Christian front comes on the scene, they say, well, you know, we're doing Catholic action. We're bringing Catholics together to talk about religious issues. They have well attended meetings where this kind of melding of politics and religion is is done and motivation is done, motivation towards action. Um, although more and more as the as the organi- organization gets going, what becomes their activity is anti-Semitic activity, anti-Semitic and anti-communistic activity. Because if you're they feel that if you're sufficiently anti-communist, what you're doing is Catholic action. If you're sufficiently anti-Semitic in their minds, then what you're doing is nothing more than than Catholic action. With these doctrines or these ideologies in place, the Christian front is growing quickly. And then within that, Cassidy's sort of subset, the military, militaristic subset is also not only growing quickly, but it seems like their activities are escalating really quickly. How did Cassidy's paramilitary group go from sort of alternating between church service and the rifle range in the summer of 1939 to just a handful of months later, trying to get their hands on military grade machine guns. Yeah. So there are a couple of different aspects to this that had never been looked at before. And the first was that Cassidy's idea was to infiltrate local national guard units at the street level. So he's operating out of Brooklyn, right? He's the Brooklyn unit. So this would be the New York National yeah, Guard. He's operating out of Brooklyn. So when when those young men fill out their membership cards, he takes notice of who's a member of the National Guard and who isn't. You've got shades of kind of January 6th there because I think this issue came up like in the days after uh, with the response to January 6th. There was some chatter about that. Actually, it wasn't chatter. It was national news reporting. And I kind of like almost fell off my chair because <laughs> kind of visions of 1940 happening. This is all taking place in 1939, 1940. So he says he's going to, so by infiltration of the National Guard, what he wants to do is he wants to place Christian front paramilitaries, the members of those action committee committees, he wants to place them in the National Guard because he concocts a plan that at the time of the revolution, which is going to be a revolution of the Christian front's choosing because they're going to, they're going to create a diversion tactic to start the revolution. He wants to have members of the front within each National Guard unit, particularly in New York, to push the National Guard towards putting down the revolution that they they feel will be started, they they will try to start, and, and then move alongside the National Guard to put down an American revolution that they feel is sponsored by Jews and communists. The members of the Christian Front who are not in the National Guard are also outfitted with military-grade weaponry, usually Lee Enfield rifles uh, and, on a couple of occasions, Browning automatic rifles. The way that the non-National Guard members, which is a considerable number of men, were outfitted militarily was through a loophole in the U.S. Army Code that apparently either John Cassidy found out about. My hunch is, and this is only a hunch, although I'm discussing this with other scholars, is that German intelligence, Nazi intelligence in the United States, put Cassidy onto this codicil within the U.S. Army Code which allowed for members of the National Rifle Association, which is free to join in the 1930s, members of the National Rifle Association could send their identity number to a department within the Department of War called the Office of Civilian Marksmanship. And you could purchase for $7.50 a military grade battle weapon rifle, usually an M19 Lee Enfield rifle. Sometimes they call it the, the Springfield rifle. Um, it was a brutal weapon. It was a, it was a five clip, uh, stripper clip, uh, bolt action rifle that saw action all throughout the Western Front in World War One. And, um, you could get that. You, if you were a member of the NRA, you could get that sent from, Washington to your local armory. And then if you paid an extra dollar 50, they would mail that 
right, that military grade rifle to your doorstep. And so that's how these cats were caching weapons. And then they were also buying, um, you could also do this. You could buy um, unused shells from World War I uh, cannons. And they, they took the cordite powder out of the, out of the shells and made bombs and uh, very descriptive. They had, they had uh, bomb making workshops in the basement of their apartments in, in Brooklyn. And prior to me kind of snooping around to find all this stuff out, nobody knew this stuff. From your description, it sounds like what we today consider a classic pipe bomb. Let me put it this way. The anarchist cookbook is like a Betty Crocker cookbook compared to this. It is child's play. They, these cats were extremely efficient at making bombs. I was shocked when I was um, coming to understand the lethality of what these folks were trying to do, because the journalists at the time and the historian sense had completely dismissed this group. And I looked at them and I, I said, man, they are holding Lee Enfield rifles. That is a weapon of war. And uh, it shoots, for example, it shoots a 30 six bullet, which most people wouldn't know about, but it's about three inch long bullet, full metal jacket. One of those bullets will go through a brick wall. And one, one of those bullets from back in 1940, all those, a 30 6 bullet is a, is a more lethal bullet than what NATO carries today. The NATO round is only being carried, um, because they can carry more of them. <laughs> the 30 6 was just a huge bullet and, um, it could do massive destru- destruction in my view. So that's why, right? Like that, I was like, wow, what, what the heck is going on here? Why are people dismissing these, these, folks as as clowns and uh when when they're actually holding pretty serious weaponry how did the fbi go from dismissing them as clowns to seeking warrants to arrest john cassidy and a a number of the other members of the action committee there had to be some sort of intelligence that, that tipped them off that something untoward was happening with the front a member of the christian front that was a member of the national guard in new york approached a gentleman named Dennis Healy, who was also in the guard. Dennis Healy was an instructor on a Browning automatic machine gun. And the Christian front member asked Healy if he could instruct members of his local marksmanship group. He didn't name them uh, in how to use a Browning automatic machine gun. And so this other guardsman who had been approached by the Christian front member who was very cagey about why he wanted Healy to instruct his friends and how to use this. He, he went directly to the FBI field office and he made this report and the FBI took that report pretty seriously. And the FBI uh, continued to do their own digging and they were able to recruit Healy as an informant, and Healy agreed to uh, infiltrate the Christian Front. And when Healy Healy's reports were declassified in 2011, and as I was reading them, they're just absolutely chilling. Just to remind our listeners what the conspiracy was that Healy and, and probably others infiltrated. What what were they plotting to do in? Uh, I guess January or February 1940. I think most people at the time wanted to do away with the religious aspects of the case. And looking at it 75 years later, I said, I've got to put religion back into this because it only makes sense if you view it religiously. John Cassidy came up with what I call the false flag defensive counterattack doctrine. And it's grounded in the theological principle that communists are infiltrating the U S government. And so whatever is done offensively against communists is philosophically defensive in nature. And so when you defend your country, when you defend yourself, 
against tyranny, and it has to be tyranny. And they consider communists and and it's symbi- communism is a symbiotic term with Judaism. So when communists are infiltrating the government, it's permissible morally for you to defend yourself by taking up arms. And so what Cassidy decides to do in, in, a, in a very cockeyed way is to s- set off a bombing campaign. He, he wants to bomb Jewish and communist businesses and organizations. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, the communist party had paramilitaries. Um, and so what he was trying to do was to kind of, uh, instigate a response from the American communists where they themselves would engage their more paramilitaristic side. And those groups would come to the defense of these of these businesses and organizations that had been bombed. And then Cassidy was going to push the button and have Governor Lehman call out the National Guard, like persuade his guard members that had infiltrated the guard, were going to push for a full deployment of the National Guard for what they saw and what they would claim was a communist revolution happening right under their nose in New York City, and that these Christian front paramilitary paramilitaries would then march alongside their brethren in the National Guard, fighting the communists, putting down the insurrection, and allowing for the Christian commonwealth to be reinstated. And as part of that installing a temporary these patriotic americans so they're very much wrapped in the american flag they want to install a temporary dictator uh yes just temporary though of course (laughs) aren't all dictators temporary when they start out right (laughs) so along with the missteps that healy made you had 70 plus years of hindsight to to look back on the case against the front how much of a factor did the church hierarchy play in whitewashing the image of the fronters who had been arrested, sort of playing up the patriotic anti-communism and down the violent anti-Semitism. How much reputational work did the the church do for the, the accused there? The church was able to insinuate itself into influencing the hierarchy of the national security apparatus in the U.S. Your listeners should be aware that this case, when it broke on uh, January 14th and January 15th of 1940, was coast to coast, headline news, all above the fold, huge reporting. It was reported as uh, an insurrection. It was reported as a resolu- revolution. Uh, Christian Fr- J. Edgar Hoover described the Christian fronters as terrorists. Uh, they had reported the language that the Christian Front used about simultaneous assassination of 12 members of Congress. These were 12 men who had helped pass the Embargo Act, which benefited Britain sometime months earlier. So there was the, the, the media coverage on this was uh, quite spectacular. So most Americans knew about this case uh, in January of uh, 1940. I was able to find in the archives at um, the Library of Congress, um, in the archives of the attorney of Attorney General uh, Robert H. Jackson, a single letter. He only had one file on the Christian Front case, and it was a single letter reporting that there, prior to the trial, because the FBI arrested seventeen members of the Christian Front, ultimately ended up putting fifteen of them on trial. Trial was covered with great spectacle throughout the spring and summer of 1940. There was a letter, and it was a single letter that indicated to, it was written by J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, to the attorney general, indicating that this is a letter that indicated this about three weeks after the conclusion of the trial. This confidential source had indicated that prior to the trial, the trial judge had met with the Bishop of Brooklyn, Archbishop Malloy, and another priest, a priest who was the kind of theological consultor 
to the Christian front. And they had had a, a secret kind of meeting about how the trial was going to proceed. This idea of a trial judge actually meeting with a bishop and a priest prior to adjudicating a case that would be put before him is extraordinary. I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV, but I'm presuming it's illegal. <laughs> yeah, one would think that's grounds for recusal yeah. at the very least, right? Yeah. And then uh, when they picked the uh, the jury, the woman who was the foreperson of the jury was actually the cousin, the first cousin of the priest that had met secretly with the F, with the judge and the bishop. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's just it's just pretty wild. And so then, then the uh, the case itself was adjudicated in a really kind of roller coaster fashion. And what's the outcome for the the fronters who are the fifteen who stood trial? So the outcome is acquittal. You know, te- technically, it's no low prosere, but it's it's essentially an acquittal. Because here's the deal: the criminal division of the Justice Department using the information from the FBI was uh, convinced that they would they could wrap this case up with the weapons charge stealing a weapon from an armory for each count is a 35 year offense right so these dudes they had they had these rifles everywhere and the FBI had no idea that if you're a member of the National Rifle Association, you could get these guns <laughs> peanuts. So yeah. so they went to trial kind of seeking the gun charges, kind of knowing, well, we're going to get them on the gun charges. And then they put the sedition charge. See, it's really difficult to prove a sedition, that the, an overthrow of the government if you're cashing, bo- cashing weapons and making bombs in New York, right? So anyway um, – they were convinced they were going to get them on the weapons theft charge, and then that just folded. Uh, it, that crumbled because you know J. Edgar Hoover was, you know, fell out of his chair when he found out about. He had no idea that, about the NRA loophole, as I call it. And then the sedition charge just didn't stick. And then thirdly, that meeting uh, between the bishop and the judge. One of the results, which we know about at the trial, which was true was that the state decided not to have religion enter into the discussion. They were worried about creating religious divisions. They were also worried about First Amendment uh, issues in connection to the uh, Religious Expression Clause uh, because the Christian Front um, set itself up as as a religious organization. So the state, the, the prosecutor from the Department of Justice, decided not to mention religion on a case that was adjudicating a crimes related to a group that called themselves the Christian Front. It was absolutely bizarre. And uh, and so they won. And then John Cassidy, the moment that the judge put the gavel down, John Cassidy, Cassidy rushed up to the to the judge and asked for his guns back. <laughs> and he was given them and walked wow. he walked out of the courthouse with his uh Enfield rifles. Armload of rifles. Armload of That's military something. weapons. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, you you point out in the book that for most observers at the time, most contemporary observers, the Christian front basically ceased to exist after that 1940 trial. But through your research and sort of on the the less public facing side of the front. They just moved to Boston. They just came north. <laughs> and that gives us a chance to introduce another key key player here, because here in Boston, Cassidy was less of an influence, and we instead deal with Francis Moran. Can you tell us a little bit about him and what the sort of the world of the Boston Irish that he grew up in was like that helped shape the the man he became? Yeah, I think you're right. As many of your listeners might might know there was that world of the Boston Irish that was so susceptible to Father Coughlin's message. It was a a world that itself was parochial. It was imbued with Roman Catholicism. It was a world of 
authority based in religion. And it was um, culturally Irish and Italian and extremely pietistic. And this is the world of Francis Moran. He is John Cassidy with less affinity for weaponry and more affinity for cerebrally trying to advance the message, the goals of the Christian front. He is, I refer to him as a working class intellectual. He's a seminarian. He's right? a dropout from the Franciscan seminary. He 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 tried to study for the priesthood. It worked out well until he was about to take his vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And then he rethought things and and left. One of the main takeaways from my research was that the seminary he went to was actually staffed by German speaking Franciscans. Uh, it was in upstate New York and they'd been kicked. Those Franciscans had been kicked out by Bismarck during the culture comp. They ended up in upstate New York and Francis Moran ends up becoming fluent in German and kind of aligning himself with uh, kind of German nationalism of a way. I can't, I can't pinpoint any real anti-Semitism at that point, but it's clearly an affinity for for rising uh, German nationalism, um, and then the the theology that would have been taught in that seminary was anti communist in its in its foundations, and it was also um, your listeners may find this strange, but it was also a very rigorous intellectual environment because. They're dealing with ideas, and 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 my my research into that particular seminary was that um, their their faculty kind of prided themselves, and their students prided themselves as being kind of a cut above uh, intellectually. And in fact, they they end up becoming men who deal in ideas, both theological and in Moran's case now theological and political. So Moran is, and Moran and his mother listen every week over their radio in Dorchester to none other than Father Coughlin. How does he actually come to be within the orbit or the sort of the inner circle of Father Coughlin? I know he, you know, he grew up more or less listening to the radio addresses, but then starting in 1936 or so, he becomes acquainted with, with the radio priest. How did that come to be? Yeah, so um, as early as 1934, Coughlin had been dabbling with electoral politics. And he started a, a kind of an ephemeral movement, uh, the Union Party back in 1934. Uh, and uh, Moran, Moran got involved with that political movement, which didn't amount to anything. But by 1936... Moran is completely imbued with Coughlin's worldview, and Father Coughlin visits Boston with a lot of fanfare. He actually meets with Mayor Curley. It's it's a it's covered in the in the press, and Moran has a, a meeting scheduled with Father Coughlin to talk about who is going to lead now, not yet the Christian Front, but who's going to lead his political apparatus in Boston, and so he has a long meeting with this Francis Moran at that time. And Moran tells him that, you know, this, we've asked this person and they won't do it. They, and Father Coughlin asks about other people, they demur. And then Moran just says, you know, what about me? Why not just make me your Boston contact for your political aspirations? And so in 1936, uh, Coughlin, who had not, he had not intended, he wanted a more high profile contact for his uh, political person in Boston, but he kind of kind of reluctantly um, and by default made this Francis Moran and, and Moran won the job because of his credentials as a former seminarian. He also was a really bright young man. He was extremely articulate. He, um, you know, for example, by 1938, he is a maestro leading public 
uh, conventions at the at the Boston Arena of ten thousand people at a time. You know how do you how do you get as a young person how do you get a stage presence to go up in front of ten thousand people and all of a sudden he's just this ringmaster and charismatic figure. This is Moran I'm talking about. He he was uh, an extremely talented young man. Uh, you know, all for the wrong ends, of course. But I, I'm the type of historian where you know I call balls and strikes. I mean, he, he was charismatic. He could, um, he could, he, he could uh, attract people to his movement. He was a terrific organizer. He was astute with logic. He could beat people at their own game. He was rather insidious. And um, as you'll probably want to talk about, he was doing a lot of other <laughs> very interesting things as well. He seems almost like a public intellectual of grievance politics in a way. <laughs> you know, he organizes these huge star-studded rallies. He's bringing in well-known folks. He's Coughlin's point man in Boston. But then at the same time, things like Browning automatic rifles – go missing from an armory in Waltham around the same time. What, was he involved in the sort of militant aspects of the front that Cassidy was also, or was he, was that more coincidental to, to the Boston front? Yeah. So there is a, a rivalry that's emerging 1938, 1939 between Cassidy and Moran, mainly because of their leadership styles. In the fall of 1938, Cassidy comes to Boston to speak at one of the rallies of 10,000 that Moran organizes. At the same time, two Browning automatic rifles, as you mentioned, go missing from the arsenal, in the, ar the armory, I should say, the National Guard armory in, in uh, Waltham. And if, you're, if your listeners don't know what a Browning automatic rifle is, it's a automatic and semi-automatic rifle that was designed to clear the trenches in World War I. It is a massively destructive weapon of war meant only to be used in a forward advance on the battlefields of Europe. And two of those were stolen. And no one was able to say anything about it in my view, because if the Boston police had found out that those weapons were missing, they possibly could have gone on strike because they had no counter weapon. Well, at the same time, there is a courtship happening in Boston involving Francis Moran. Eventually, it'll end up with the Christian front being sort of more or less subsumed into actual Nazism. But it, it doesn't start out that way. Without going too far into the rabbit hole of like the internal politics of Weimar Germany. Can you introduce the agent who ended up recruiting Francis Moran to spy for Germany? Who was uh, Herbert Schultz? At the same time, Moran is coming into his own as leader of the Christian front. A Nazi SS officer lands in Boston in November of 1938. And this is not just any... This is somebody who's forged in the same fires as Hess and Himmler. Yes, he he fits into the pantheon of of Nazi uh, henchmen uh, of Hitler. The interesting thing for me was no one had studied any of this. Like no one knew about Moran. No one knew about Scholes. I mean, what was known about Scholes was kind of what was out there on World War II chat boards and things like that. There was no – so these folks – completely lost to history. And what you find is the person who gets sent to Boston for the Nazis is a, is a man who was a protege of Ernst Rom, who with Adolf Hitler established the Brown shirts, this Sturm Abteilung. He then uh, worked for Rome for a number of years and then was poached from the Brown shirts personally by Heinrich Himmler the architect of the Holocaust, and trained up by Himmler within the Nazi party headquarters where, where he had an office. This guy Scholz had an office where for two years he worked as the aide de camp as kind of the secretary to a guy named Rudolf Hess, who would become the deputy Fuhrer, right? So 
Himmler and Hess and Hitler formed this guy Scholz, who nobody knows about, really, to, to become this heavyweight. And they sent him to the United States to turn the screws on all of the German diplomats in America who aren't quite towing the Nazi line as as heavily as they would want them to. After Kristallnacht, uh, there's a professor at Harvard named Heinrich Brüning. He's a professor of politics, and he was previously the chancellor of Germany. He was the kind of the longest serving chancellor of Weimar Germany. He had to quickly leave Germany in the dead of night because the Gestapo was after him. And he ends up teaching politics at Harvard. And after Kristallnacht, his conscience was moved to start making anti-Hitler speeches. And consequently, this guy, Herbert Scholz, this protege of the pantheon of Nazi henchmen, shows up in Boston under diplomatic cover as the consul, the, the German consul in Boston. And he's a an amazing spy master. And it's only a matter of time before Scholz is able to take view of the landscape and hit upon Francis Moran as a potential target for his recruitment. How did Schultz come to, to target Moran? What, what made him the perfect recruit? Moran's anti-Semitic, anti-British, and anti-communist, which, although at the time the Nazis were allied by a pact with the Soviet Union, Scholz could work around that and use Scholz always kind of used Moran's anti-communism to, to work more towards Judeo-Bolshevism, that symbiotic relationship between communism and Judaism that, that's a myth that Scholz was able to use. And and soon enough, the two of them were meeting secretly. They were speaking in German. Uh, Moran was given a code name. A friendship emerged that was very, very tight. Basically, Moran placed himself into Scholz's protection and did his uh, did his bidding, and we have documentation of that fact that starts in July of 1940. But we see the contours of that relationship showing some some effect as early as late 1939 in Boston. It seems like his self image as a patriotic American. And a deeply convicted Catholic would conflict with the values of the Nazi party. Do you have any sense of how Moran was able to reconcile his patriotism and his religious conviction with his slow embrace of Nazism? Again, it's kind of religiously based as well. There's a section of St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica, which would have been the dominant theological construction at the time, which indicates that it's permissible for force to be used if the leadership of a state is tyrannical. And what I've noticed in my discussion of how Moran places Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, into the context for his audience is that he keeps referring to Roosevelt and the Roosevelt administration as a tyrant and tyrannical. And that's not simply just language that's pulled from out of thin air. It's language that is um, theologically based. Because for Catholics, although violence is never preferred in Aquinas's just war theory, if the leadership is tyrannical, it's uh, permissible for the tyrant to be removed or deposed, as Aquinas says. And so he, I think Moran feels that with the backing of the Reich, he, he's found a friend who can help him depose the Roosevelt administration, which is filled with communists and Jews, which is the same thing that Cassidy believed when he was making bombs in his basement to try to get the National Guard to get 
Roosevelt out of office and his um, Jewish cabinet, as he would say. It's really, really amazing stuff. As Moran starts to align himself behind Schultz and get drawn deeper and deeper into the embrace of, of Nazism, it changes the Boston front. How does that transit? How does Moran's transitions start to change the organization that he's he's running here in Boston? And how's it? How does it change how he addresses the public? So Scholz convinces Moran that the old Cassidy way of doing things isn't the way that they should proceed. They're not going to be able to to make inroads using what what Scholz calls terrorism. He says, "Not we're not going to use terrorism." but we're going to use propaganda. That's what Scholl says to Moran. But what, what he means is, and what in fact happens is that they use espionage. And so for Scholl's, one of the primary functions of Moran as an agent is to propagate the Nazi line in terms of publicity. And so I track how Moran's speeches to his Christian front audiences and keep in mind, he was meeting at Hibernian Hall in Roxbury. He was getting sold out meetings. Now, this is you know anywhere from 500 to 1,500 people coming two nights a week. Um, and basically, all Moran did was he read the newspaper headlines of the day and then read the, read the missalette from the local church and basically applied – Christian principles to what he was reading in the uh, in the newspapers, and he would stand up on the stage in Hibernian Hall and just pack them in, which is which is rather extraordinary because you you couldn't you know I'm not sure you're getting that many people in church on Sunday, but here is Moran and and his his speeches become more and more pro Nazi over time, more and more pro Hitler, more and more anti-U.S. military. He's breaking laws all over the place. For example, in one speech, Moran asks all the mothers present to write letters to their sons who are in the army or the navy to have them put down their guns because the German Wehrmacht is is never going to be able to be defeated. So he's trying to influence morale. He's talking about the terrible conditions on military bases in Massachusetts. He's eventually he's sort of defending saboteurs almost, it sounds like. He takes a really hard right turn until he, he eventually gets the attention of the federal government and who wonders, is he an unregistered foreign agent? Right. How does he manage to escape prosecution there? This is the maddening piece of the entire puzzle. Not only was Ma- Moran not convicted he was not even detected. So, so what I'm kind of arguing is that the relationship between Moran and Scholes is one of the most significant espionage relationships of World War II, particularly in the U.S. And the FBI, the OSS, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Boston Police, the Boston Police Radical Division – the military intelligence, we're all surveilling the Christian front. And none of those agencies picked up that Moran was an agent of Scholes. I think that the national security apparatus at the time, particularly the FBI, was in disbelief that an American citizen, that a natural born American citizen would ever fall into the arms of the Nazis to do espionage work coupled with the religious camouflage that Moran was using, they simply didn't see the spy in front of them. In fact, except for there was one kind of flaky FBI agent who listened to a Moran speech and wrote in his report something to the effect of, gosh, if you didn't no, this guy was Irish. You'd think he was German. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because he remains unprosecuted and basically undetected by the feds. But on the local level, the BPD does decide to take some sort of action. What did they do? What did the BPD do when they learned that Moran was distributing what, what they considered banned Nazi propaganda? The Boston police made a big mistake 
because Moran was distributing pamphlets, which you allude to, which were presumed by the police to be banned in Boston, if I could use that term. <laughs> um, so he was he was distributing literature from a publishing house in New Jersey that was controlled by a Nazi agent. The problem is when the Boston police moved in to take down Moran for such distribution, the Nazi agent in question had only been indicted and had not been convicted. And so under the First Amendment, all of that literature that he was distributing was fully protected under the First Amendment because because um, it wasn't deemed – uh, being having been produced by a foreign agent. And so the Boston police move in. They don't arrest Moran, but they detain him. And this infuriates both the local FBI in Boston, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover in Washington goes ballistic, and the Attorney General of Massachusetts is furious because what it does is it takes it takes Moran off the public scene and it it doesn't allow them to actually be able to monitor him above ground and perhaps kind of put some charges together um in, in other words if he makes a misstep or a mistake legally then then they can they can do something about him but frankly he had not made a legal mistake i don't say this in my in my writing but I think he had a huge case against the Boston Police Department for just for his detention um, that he probably could have won, uh, particularly since they didn't know he was not like nobody knew right. this guy was a Nazi spy. He was I, again, he's like the biggest Nazi spy in America. World War Two was actually domestic. And, you know, nobody knows he goes to his grave like nobody know, knew this until. Basically, the book was published in 2021. And it, so it's not the mass attorney general pushing this investigation into Moran. It's not the Suffolk County DA. It's not the FBI. Who is pushing investigation into, into Moran in the front as you know, basically a, a Nazi front corporation? It's a neighborhood watch organization made up of local citizens, which calls themselves the Irish American Defense Association. So I did what every good historian does. I go to Google Books and I type in Irish American Defense Association. And I came up with the one book published in 1998 that actually mentioned the group, a book called Desperate Deception by Thomas Mal. It, that book doesn't get any credit, but it's a great book. So I check it out from the library and I read through. And in the footnotes, Thomas Mal, the author, says, Basically, he says, you know, I can't prove it because the files for this organization are still classified in, in the British archives. But my hunch is that the Irish American Defense Association in downtown Boston is actually a front organization of British intelligence, MI6. So, so I read the footnote and I write a letter to the British National Archives and come to find out in 2017, they decide to declassify Ooh. the files of the Irish American Defense Association. So I make a beeline over to London and I put in my request and they bring out this whole cartload, huge cartload of files of this group. And it's all filled with top secret documents <laughs> from Boston. <laughs> I was like, oh, my. So basically this group and again, they recruited a leader who's kind of in the book become kind of the hero or hero heroine, uh, Francis Sweeney. She's a she's recruited by a secret British agent who she does. So a cutout, if you will, in the tradecraft speak, the British have an American who's actually working for them, who recruits this woman from Somerville named. Francis Sweeney to become their public face of this Irish American Defense Association. And it's supposed to be, again, this kind of like neighborhood watch organization against fascists and pro Nazis and all bad folk like that. And, uh, and she's a dynamo and she leads the charge. 
and uh, she has her own motivations. And so she now becomes the foil to Moran. So Moran's basically Moran's being run by the Nazis, Nazi intelligence. Sweeney's being run by British intelligence. The FBI knows nothing about any of this. <laughs> <laughs> and and neither does anybody else in the intelligence right. community in the United States. And so these two entities start going at it in South Boston. And and Sweeney's lauded as a genuine anti-fascist. So it's interesting to see that much like Moran's double identity, that that genuine conviction, which also came from her deep religious convictions, that it that, that can live alongside her utilization by British intelligence. Well, we shall see, right? Because the secret life of Francis Sweeney is hardly ever alluded to. I actually felt bad about kind of uncovering this because she is an icon of kind of 20th century liberalism, anti-fascism. She's, she also, you know, she's a devout Catholic and she's motivated to take down the Christian front because she believes that anti-Semitism is a sin in 1940, a position that the church won't get to officially until 1965. So she's, you know, she's a woman ahead of her time. But as I say, you know, when I got the top secret documents released and found that she was an unwitting agent of British intelligence, yeah, it was, it was a bit um, deflating, right? Because she was this kind of anti-fascist icon and no one had known this about her. Um, but the other thing is, you know, as a historian, I got to call balls and strikes and um, I got to call it like I see it and how I find it in the archives and what the documents tell me. Francis Moran was breaking the Foreign Agents Registration Act. So was Francis Sweeney. I was giving a talk once and um, a very high ranking member of the British military and a general officer in the British military was very upset by this news. And asked me, you know, how do you know that she was actually working for the British? And I said, I've got the pay stubs, <laughs> you know, like we have her paychecks. You know, we know how much she was getting paid by MI6 to do the work she was doing. So it's, you know, it's fascinating, but it's also morally very difficult to navigate. And as a historian, you always have to keep in mind that the anxieties of wartime may not have the story be written in straight lines. People become different when they're affected by global forces at the neighborhood level, right at the street level. And that's what I thought was so great about this work was I was getting to the heart of the matter right at the, at the neighborhood level in, in Somerville and Malden and Roxbury. And that, you know, the Nazis were there, the British were there, the Russians come in later on. Hmm. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. You don't think about the, all the spies and counter spies that are happening on the home front. You think of that as something that happens in, you know, back alley in Vienna or something. Right. And not exactly. And, and the, the, the great, the thing for me is because I'm, I, I, I love doing religious history is that the focus of it all is, is religion. That, right. And that's that's the camouflage that you have to be able to kind of peel away in order to see the the nitty gritty of the of the activity. Well, for Moran and, and the front, so much of what they were doing was trying to influence Americans to stay out of the war. But then in December 7th, 1941, war comes. So how long does the Christian front last after the United States enter, enters the war. The Boston police move against Moran happened in the first week of January of 1942. By the way, that takedown was orchestrated by Francis Sweeney. And what it did was precisely what I thought it would do. And it sent Moran underground. And the Christian front becomes a cell structure it goes underground from 1942 to 1945. It becomes much more exterminationist. In other words, Moran becomes obsessed with the killing of Jews. And he wants to recruit returning veterans who he feels are now sufficiently trained in firearms to do that work. I mean, it's really, really chilling. 
That was the second part of the FBI file that I had to get released. There were two parts of the Boston file. One was the above ground. The other, which was much harder to get, was when they went into their cell structure. And they had informants inside the cell structure. And they were about to convict, to take down Moran. But their informant, who to this day is unidentifiable. She just goes, I know she's a woman. She went by the code name informant T1. Informant T1 refused to publicly take the chair in a court of law because she was afraid she would be killed if she did so. And and this happens again and again in connection to the Christian front and with Shoals. The, The people who actually could put them away and identify them as who they are are deathly afraid of being killed in both cases, in Scholz's case and in, in Moran's case. And so there, that prosecution uh, never takes place. And, and by 1944, 1945, Moran is more obsessed, probably more dangerous uh, than he ever has been. Moran actually joins the service. He ends up enlisting in the U S army, but, he gets assigned to, to the 620th Engineer General Service Company. What what did his unit do during the war? What what was that unit all about? There's a bit of murkiness about this because perhaps some of your listeners would know in, in 1976, the National Archives in St. Louis burned down in a fire. Uh, and that held all of the Army personnel records of most of the servicemen in World War II. So what I was able to piece together is that he was assigned to a unit for disloyal Americans who were suspected of either espionage or subversion. And he was sent out west to Arizona to build the buildings that the Japanese internees would eventually live in. He's not allowed to have any correspondence with with anyone on the outside except his family. He is basically put under surveillance within the U.S. Army. Interestingly enough, this in the same division is assigned a, a student from Harvard who's convicted of, of uh, espionage and was um, charged with treason. And, and, and the, uh, the judgment was that he was to be hanged, a guy named Dale Maple. And he was recruited by Scholz. This guy, Maple, was recruited by Scholz when he was a student at, at Harvard and uh, to be a Nazi agent. But Moran is uh, – his time in the Army is time in basically a penal uh, unit. And he becomes – you know, if you could imagine him being more against the world and disgruntled, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> um, he, he becomes even more – pro-Nazi and pro-fascist, even as the even as the war is concluding, and eventually leaves the army by by 1945 and is back in Boston. Around the same time he's enlisting in the army, there's a lot of anti-Semitic violence in the streets of Boston in sort of late 1942, especially 1943, in neighborhoods where Jewish communities and Irish Catholic communities mixed, places like Grove Hall, Mattapan. Do you have any sense whether that violence was directed or inspired by Moran or the front or whether it was just sort of independent action by wilding youths? Here's what I've been able to do. I've been tracking Moran's enlistment in the army. He keeps delaying his enlistment in the army. He's actually drafted, but in fact, he puts on his draft card that he he, he makes a voluntary statement that he will refuse to follow the orders of of any tyrannical government, which the U.S. government allows him to put on the draft card because they don't know what it means. But he delays and he delays until late December of 1943. So he's in Boston when the anti-Semitic gang violence breaks out in the summer of 1943 and to the fall of into the fall of 1943. And for your listeners, this is this is a, a massive uptick in rioting of Irish Catholics, anti-Semitized Irish Catholics, as I call them, on Jewish youth. And the, the usual way that it started was that gangs of Irish Catholics would confront young Jews 
walking in their neighborhoods, asked them what they thought of Hitler or told them that if they didn't say that Hitler was a good guy, they would, they would be beaten up. And that's what, that's what happened. So that's, that's a huge problem. And it's, It's kind of roiling Boston at the time. It's kept out of the newspaper headlines because many members of the Jewish community did not want to have their fellow Americans view them as problematic, frankly. But they weren't the problem. They were victims in in all this. And the Boston police, which had been infiltrated by the Christian Front and Moran, was also very instrumental in this. At the same time, when Moran was detained in 19... first week of January, 1942, he gave a statement to the police commissioner and it was a 13 page statement. And the commissioner asked him a question about whether he had a shortwave radio in his home or not. And Moran answered, yes. He said, yes, I have a shortwave radio in my home, but it's only a receiver. It's not a transmitter. And the police commissioner let that go. Like there was no follow up. So Moran is on site in Boston. He's been drafted into the army. He's kind of trying to figure out how to delay the army. And he's got a shortwave, at least receiver in his home. But he's worked for Scholes for over two years now. And Scholes is a master of spies. Moran and Scholes had a meeting the night before Scholes had to leave the United States And they were able to shake the FBI surveillance of Scholes. Moran's a complete amateur, keep in mind. They were able to shake that surveillance and have their meeting. And I actually was able to get some verbatim about what they talked about. So it's, and, 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 and Moran kind of at that last meeting kind of offers his allegiance to Scholes. And Scholes tells him, he says, stay in place. You stay here and, We'll kind of be in touch. So I don't have the documentary proof to connect Scholes as orchestrating from Europe where he goes on to to be the aide to Karl Wolf, who's the highest ranking SS general over in Italy. I have no idea if he's still orchestrating Scholes at this time by the fall of 1943. But the contours fit. After his army service begins, does the level of street violence change in Boston? Does Is there a drop-off? Is there an uptick? Or does it just stay level at that yeah, So Francis Sweeney gets involved. And Francis Sweeney actually pushes a New York magazine to finally put the Catholic on Jewish violence on the front pages. And once... Once that happens, the mayor of Boston gets involved. Governor Saltonstall gets involved. It becomes coast to coast news, and and the local and the the police commissioner, the mayor, and the governor all get involved. And um, eventually, the the situation is is rectified. As we sort of come to a hopefully a natural closing, I realize I've kept you here a long time. I'm just curious where everybody lands after the war. So where, what happens to Schultz? What happens to Moran? And what happens to the Christian front? Because it didn't completely evaporate with the ending of the war. So what happens after peace? So America wants to kind of quickly forget about the war and get back to things to try to become normal again. Schultz was able to head to Buenos Aires. Uh, where he stayed for about six months through the, a letter of recommendation from Cardinal Fossati of Turin, who was in and around there in Italy where, where Scholz, Scholz and Wolf were during the war. He ends up having a brief affair with the first wife of a guy who became a fashion designer that your listeners may know, Count Oleg Cassini. He was the fashion designer to Jackie Onassis, right? So he designed all of Jackie's hats. 
his first wife was a Nazi sympathizer. She ended up with Scholes in Buenos Aires for about a, for a fling, basically. They had been having an on and off thing all through the war. Then he leaves Buenos Aires and leaves her. Actually, she left him because she was, he, he apparently was indicating that he felt that Nazism would rise again and that he needed to be in place for the new rise of Nazism. His consort was not of the same uh, view and she just left him. <laughs> and then he went to, uh, he went to have a meeting with the Krupp family uh, of Krupp Ironworks and then moved to Bolivia and uh, opened a copper mine. He bought a copper mine in Bolivia. Then uh, in 1958, when uh, a more communist style government uh, came in in Bolivia, he left and went back to Germany. In the meantime, he had married a Yugoslavian countess and he petitioned the new German Democratic Republic for a pension because, in his view, he was nothing but a diplomat. And in fact, the, one of the only things that had survived the war was were the diplomatic lists. So his diplomatic cover allowed him to claim a pension in the new government, and they gave it to him. And he bought a villa with his countess on the shores of Lake Starnberg outside of a beautiful, beautiful lake outside of, uh, outside of Munich and lived there until his death in 1985. That's not the justice you hope for, for somebody that high up in the Nazi organization. You mentioned that after his enlistment was up, that Moran returned to Boston or the Boston area. How did he live out his life after yeah, the war so was between, over? Between 1945 and 1947, he complains bitterly in the press that the communists are keeping him out of getting a job. He takes a job as a taxi driver in the late 1940s. The last we hear of him publicly is that he's um, victim of a taxi cab robbery, kind of like a stick up. He picked up two brothers in, in Roxbury and, uh, and his cab was, was held up at knife point. It's unclear who those brothers were. <laughs> So then he um, he falls off the radar for a long time, and then he gets a job working for the Boston Public Library for a couple of years as a clerk in in one way or another. It's it's hard to tell whether he was in the reference desk or circulation desk. It's unclear, but it makes sense. He he was always a bookish individual. He was a man of ideas. An intellectual, again, like a working, but a working class intellectual, not not the sort of intellectual that that would be recognized in Harvard Square, of course. And so, uh, so he lives out his days peacefully. I, I think, uh, you know, his his case file for the FBI closes in 1949, and then they're done with him. And I think his silence until the grave is a part of his astute nature. Because if the FBI really started digging, he could have gone to jail. He should have gone to jail for a long, long time. He was breaking the Foreign Agents Registration Act. He was breaking the Espionage Act. He was breaking um, the morale clause of the Espionage Act, as well as the, es the espionage clauses. And he, he could have gone to jail for a long, long time. And so my view is that he remained out of the limelight. He lived a quiet life because he knew very well that he could get be convicted for espionage if anyone ever found out he was working with Shoals. And he almost got caught. He almost got caught around uh, 1949, 1950, when a DOJ lawyer interviewed Shoals in Germany. And Shoals spilled the beans to this. DOJ lawyer, O. John Rogie, and that that lawyer sat on it. Scholz kind of explained to the guy that he was breaking the Espionage Act with Moran, and that DOJ lawyer went back to the United States after he was inter he interrogated Scholz in Germany, went back to the United States and sat on that. And so Scholz got off scot-free and Moran got off and 
a piece of paper and a file in a drawer somewhere that nobody ever yeah, saw I, again. I'm not sure you're supposed to do that as a lawyer when someone explains that they're actually committing crime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if you work for the DMJ. <laughs> yeah, a big crime. I think you're supposed to just <laughs> right. shove that under the rug. <laughs> well, I've got to tell you, I could sit here and talk about this book all night. I think looking through my notes, I've probably – Asked about a third of the questions that I wrote down, but I've kept you here way longer than I said I would. And I appreciate that. So before I let you go, is there anything that you wish I had asked you about tonight that I didn't? Just to kind of a teaser, Russian spies show up just because, you know, Russian meddling is in the news these days. They're there, man. They <laughs> they show up in, in Roxbury. They show up at the neighborhood level. And it's it's not your usual Russian spy. It's actually Soviet military intelligence is kind of on the ground in in Roxbury, kind of trying to push push a certain narrative. So that's a really interesting piece that is the other the other expository components are so kind of blockbuster in a lot of ways that that Russian piece, I think, gets lost. But I think it's really, really interesting. And so readers will have to pick up a copy or listeners will have to pick up a copy of Nazis of Copley Square, The Forgotten Story of the Christian Front by Professor Charles R. Gallagher. Uh, Professor Gallagher, if people want to follow uh, you, follow your work online, where should they look for that? Well, first, I would go to the publisher website, which is Harvard University Press. They have multiple links for more information. Uh, and then also the book is available on Amazon.com. All right. We'll make sure to link to both of those from the show notes today. I just want to say one more time, thank you very much for joining me today and for being so generous with your time. Like I say, I could go on and on. I <laughs> will stop now and let you go, but I really appreciate how generous you've been with your time today. Jake, this has been great. I'm very fortunate to um, be able to speak with your listeners. Thank you so much. Well, that's about all for this week. To learn more about the Nazis of Copley Square, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 258. I'll include a link to purchase the book, as well as a link to Professor Gallagher's page on the Harvard University Press site, which has links to tons of sources and press coverage about the book. Plus, for anyone who's listening from Minnesota, we'll link to information about a book talk that he's giving on November 3rd at the University of St. Thomas, which is in St. Paul. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email podcast at hubhistory.com. We are Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, but we're most active on Twitter. Or you can go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. If you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please consider writing us a brief review. If you do, drop me a line and I'll send you a Hub History sticker as a token of appreciation. That's all for now. Stay safe out there, listeners. 